Hello, my name is Deborah Bowman, artist and instructor at the Bordeaux Montaigne University in France, doctoral student in arts and the Mika ADS laboratory. Today I'm presenting a, a communication uh, by the independent New York curator Larry List entitled Drawing from Life, Personal History and Artistic Identity, Part One. The communication will be in English and in French. A special welcome to my master's students in the course Globalization of Art. Thank you to Mika ADS Laboratory and to the Bordeaux Montaigne University for hosting this communication. Thanks so much, Larry, for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm broadcasting from uh, here in New York from the studio of Kathy Grove, uh, who has better technical equipment than I am. So if you see me labeled Kathy Grove, that's why. Uh, in the arts today, I see a generation being informed by a professional level of arts education, but also pressured uh, to conform with the immediate art trends and fashions of the moment. In English now, um, Larry List has worked as a studio artist, model builder, researcher, writer, creator, and master planner of exhibition spaces around the world. He has a BFA from the Tyler School of Art and MA and MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Researching and replicating lost artworks from museums led to curating exhibitions for the Noguchi Museum, the Menel Collection, the Reykjavik Art Museum, and the DOX Contemporary Art Center in Prague. Among his curatorial projects are found language, digital domains, skin trade, uh, skin as material or metaphor, Cage and Kino, an artworks by John Cage and Glenn Kino. He's the author of books and cure and the book and curatorial project, Image, Imagery of Czech Chess Revisited. Here in Bordeaux, he's recently contributed writings for the Takako Saito exhibition at the Seattle Sea. Currently, Larry List is writing a book on the transition of 20th century print processes into the 21st century digital media. And uh, thank you again, Larry, and we'll move on to the next slide. Ah. Okay. Yes. What once was the art world primarily centered on artworks and artists has now become the art market dominated by art fairs, collectors, and price lists. And so as a young professional, you ask yourself, where am I in all of this? How do you find your own identity in the arts uh, while uh, in, in art magazines, one encounters only master narratives about each artist? It is always a noble story of how the artists brilliantly arrived at their concepts and style without predecessors, origins, or life experiences that helped them. However, the master narrative history is often just the cover story. Unlike art historians, I am not interested in the formal history and these master narratives. Instead, more like a detective, I am interested in what really happened. Let's look at some artists' lives more deeply and discover what experiences contributed to their originality. Since this is France, I would like to begin with a French artist, Marcel Duchamp, from whom I took many hints and directions. When asked about his interests, he famously said, I'm not interested in art. I am only interested in artists. Duchamp was born into a family with two older artist brothers, Raymond Duchamp Villon, a sculptor, and painter printmaker Jacques Villon, and a younger sister, the painter Suzanne Duchamp. He had plenty of artistic community, but how could he distinguish himself in such a, a, a rich artistic tradition? Marcel looked not to his artistic siblings, but rather to his father, who was a notary. Marcel grew up seeing his father paid to take common documents and simply with the authority of his signature, 
transform them from a humble form into profound legal documents. Beginning in 1913, Duchamp revolutionized the art world by applying this idea to create ready-mades. He chose humble everyday objects and using the authority of his signature alone, transformed them into a more serious, important form, art. It was a dramatic gesture that made everyone look at the world around them in a whole new way. Okay. Another radical artist who drew inspiration from a parent was, was Andy Warhol. Warhol grew up poor in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he pasted green stamps into savings books with his mother as a kid. Whenever a book was filled, she said, this is money, Andy. Perhaps from the memories of the green stamp books with their grids of repeated identical images becoming money, Andy got the, the idea of making his silkscreen printed paintings of repeated identical images, images repeated over and over to become money. When gallerist Eleanor Ward offered Warhol his first show, he asked, what should I paint? Ward told him to paint what you love most. So Warhol painted his lucky dollar bill and his everyday food, Campbell's soup. Damien Hirst shocked the art world with his sharks and other animals and tanks of formaldehyde. Many thought it was simply a wild, sensational, uh, monumental stunt. But young Damien, shown in the upper left photo with the severed head of a cadaver, was also poor and he paid for art school working at night as a lab assistant in a pathology laboratory handling and dissecting dead people to determine how and why they died. This early experience led him to his long lasting obsession with mortality, uh, the formaldehyde tanks, uh, many artworks of stainless steel, medical furniture, pill bottles, and even opening a bar and restaurant named Pharmacy. Once successful, Hearst even made a self portrait as a surgeon, no longer a lowly lab assistant, and he named his art studio Damien Hearst and Science Limited. Richard Serra, on the other hand, got a bachelor's degree in literature, an MFA at Yale Graduate School, but he grew up in a house overlooking the shipyard where his father worked. Which do you think influenced his style the most? For decades, he has had his sculptures fabricated in a shipyard in Germany. Barbara Kruger was a picture editor and caption writer for fashion magazines where she developed the elements of her signature style. Kathy Grove worked as a fashion and graphics photo retoucher with Tibor Kallman at Colors Magazine um, on the issue about race, where they wondered, what if the Queen of England was Polynesian or Arnold Schwarz Schwarzenegger was black or Michael Jackson was white. Grove did a fashion retouching makeover of Dorothea Lange's iconic migrant mother to demonstrate the hidden effects of advertising retouching. Grove then produced the other series, eliminating all women from masterworks made by male artists. She even saved every digital wrinkle and blemish she removed from fashion photos and then used them all to make her series, The Outtakes. Lori Anderson studied classical violin and originally was an art history lecturer until she was fired for making up fake stories about projected slides. She then studied sculpture and made herself the sculpture by playing violin until the ice on her skates melted. She then repeated her art history lecturer template by showing slides and telling stories, but she created this time a new art form, performance art. Lisa Yuskevich studied the history of figure painting and popular culture. A voluptuous young woman, she paid for art school working as a figure drawing model 
What did she think about all those hours standing naked on a model stand surrounded by drawing students? She made paintings that addressed the subject of contemporary fantasies of the gays. A much different use of the figure was found in the work of David Sally, who did paste up and picture editing for pornography magazines. And he discovered the transgressive imagery he superimposed over minimalist monochrome panels. Takako Saito was born to a wealthy family in Japan. As a child, she learned traditional Japanese tools and techniques from craftsmen who built and repaired the family estate. After studying child psychology at Tokyo Women's University, she refused to marry the son of another wealthy family. Disinherited for her rebellion, she supported herself by working on construction sites in Tokyo. She became deeply involved in Sozu Biku Undo, or the Sobi movement, a theory of art education that encouraged people of all ages to be freely creative in all activities, art, dance, cooking, etc. So be focused on free play and participation by all, a great contrast to the conformism widespread in post-war Japan. She then moved to New York and worked with Fluxus group leader, George McCunis. Like Sobe in Japan, Fluxus focused on communal art efforts, a spirit of irreverence and play. Saito created many of the games and objects for the communal art movement, including the iconic sound chess, smell chess, weight chess, and others. Working her way across Europe as a restaurant chef and book designer, she settled in Dusseldorf, where she has worked for the past 40 years on sculpture, painting, drawing, book form art, performances, costumes, and over 100 game designs. Here, at the CAPC Bordeaux were wine chess and Petit Four chess performances. As well as myself and Dieter Daniels performing sound chess and Takako Saito encountering sort of uh, Deborah Bowman during Blind Touch Opera. The 400 piece exhibition also included her major interactive installations and performances involving the exchange of goods. These artists made their art reflect their life experiences. At times, others transformed deficits into creative assets. Isamu Noguchi, for instance, was biracial during an era when discrimination was brutal and intense. He was not accepted in Japan as Japanese and he was rejected in an American art review as nothing but a little Japanese mistake. Here we see the Western boy trying to be Asian and the Asian boy trying to be Western. Just as he was more than one thing in his heritage, Noguchi pursued more than one thing in his work. He let his alienation set him free to do sculpture, lighting designs, dance and theater set designs, furniture, early earthwork proposals, park and sculpture garden designs, and site-specific interior architectural works. Noguchi worked and traveled all over the world doing everything successful global 23rd century artists aspired to do. He just did it a century earlier. Here we have John Cage, a friend of Noguchi's. He was an American composer and musician. He was told by the famous teacher Arnold Schoenberg, you can never be a composer. You have no sense of harmony. To which Cage replied, then I will just have to beat my way through things. Cage went on to compose innovative all percussion performances. He made each of the parts simple enough that even amateur groups could perform them. 
His performances at small venues across America introduced him to a wide audience. The son of an inventor, Cage later used prepared pianos, exploited silence and everyday sounds. He also used the I Ching, chance operations and computers to plot his compositions. A friend of Cage's, painter Jasper John's first drawing teacher told him, you have no ability to draw academically figures or landscape, and you have no sense of color. You can only make elegant marks. So John's decided to choose things the mind already knows and then fill them up with his elegant marks. And Princeton pre-law student Frank Stella had high visual intelligence, but no traditional drawing or hand skills, even though he was encouraged to switch to art and move to New York to start painting seriously. Stella let the shape of the canvas determine the entire composition of the painting. To avoid his inability to choose and blend colors, he painted entire canvases the same color, concentrically repeating the canvas shape. Stella then literally turned to drawing tools, protractors, as both his drawing tools and his painted subjects. And later he turned to French curves and boat curves as his tools and painted subjects. In each case, the artists presented weren't doing what was already recognized as acceptable art. What they have in common is that they were all first told that isn't art. You must each do the same. Remember, artists are scavengers who find inspiration in subjects from their lives that most people ignore. And so in the midst of this giant art world, I encourage each of you to consider your own personal history to discover your own artistic identity. Examine yourself, trust yourself, be yourself. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Larry, so much for this presentation. It was uh, really very enlightening, so interesting and such, uh, such a great history. Um, I wondered if you would um, just repeat this uh, story about um, your advice to young artists, uh, including don't worry if your art is not in style, it may become, um, it may become very noticed years later. And you had a story about Kathy Grove. Would yeah. you tell us, would you tell us that story, please? Sure. Um, Kathy Grove sort of began the other series uh, in the early 1980s. And she actually had a show at Pace McGill Gallery uh, of the pieces. And the Peter McGill was very enthusiastic about them. But it, his gallery at the time was a photo gallery, and it still is. But, but at that point, uh, photography was still very rigid. And so the people who came to his gallery said, well, these are interesting, but they're not really photos because they've been tampered with and they have paint, painted over parts of them. So they aren't real photographs. So I'm not interested in collecting them. And then Kathy tried a couple of years later with uh, a gallery sort of in Soho, uh, PPOW, and they mounted a show of, of the works. And their a sort of audience, primarily painting and sculpture uh, enthusiasts said, well, but these, these aren't really, um, they aren't really artwork so much as they're just retouched photographs. And so, the public didn't have the consciousness yet to look at the things for what they were. And so she continued to work and she's continued to work in the series even to this day um, on the pieces. But many, many, many years later in about, I think it was 2000, 
10 or so, the phone rings in her studio and they said, uh, we're looking for Kathy Grove. I'm calling from the Metropolitan Museum. And she thought, oh, well, this is something they wanted me to do art restoration or something. And no, it was their photo curator and said, are you the Kathy Grove who did the wonderful iconic other series? And she says, why, yes. She said, do you possibly have any of those works still in your hands? And would it be possible for us to come see them? And possibly, would you be willing to sell us any of them? And so Kathy sort of invited them down. They spent three or four hours in the studio. They ended up buying a number of pieces. And lo and behold, they were the concluding gallery in the first major survey show called Faking It, the Art of uh, Manipulated Photography. So she started in the 1980s and it took until over 2000 before the public and the art audience uh, were able to catch up or arrive at the kind of awareness that was necessary to appreciate these works. And there are many, many, many of these stories. And so I just think that it's important for young artists and young researchers, you know, maybe you're writing about a subject that is of great fascination and you think is very important, but it doesn't seem like anybody else is interested. Well, if you persist, your day will come. And I, I talk about these stories of artists and how they really started out specifically so that people know that because it's, there's a very strong influence of the master narrative that the person just sat in a room and read the right books and then sort of came up with the right idea. And that's important, but that's not all that is involved. And so that's why I stress that it's so important for people to examine their own lives and to trust in their own sort of interests. Um, thanks so much, Larry. And in this question and answer period with um, the students, you also stressed um, the importance of generosity, of be willing to help people without getting paid, of um, a sincere interest in people and meeting people who are not necessarily compared with the art world and, and how that was important for you. Um, also writing thank you notes that you said you had found really powerful. And then again, um, um, be willing to do an internship that is not a paid internship, en français c'est un stage, non payé, and how that has been so important for um, interns of, or of you uh, working on your projects to learn different skills that they can use later um, and learn them in real life situations. And um, I, I think this is a real inspiration to all of us, how you've encouraged um, art students and emerging artists to look at the periphery, uh, to be true to yourself, um, to not worry about if your work is, is in style or not, and um, to also not be afraid to use those important personal um, things from your, uh, from your life. And as you said, to do the work that you love. Um, do you have any last words to add to that before we leave? No, I think that, that that's about it. Uh, um, you know, I regret that internships are often unpaid, but so often art projects aren't funded until after they happen. And so it sort of is a necessary evil in that respect. But again, it's sort of um, one must just sort of trust in oneself, follow your interests, and the world will catch up with you eventually. Right. Um, please tell us again this David Burns story. <laughs> well, I had noticed sort of piecemeal sort of that there were various things going on. Uh, involving people using 
texts from other sources to make their art out of, not texts that they wrote, but things taken from other sources. You mean and, appropriation? Excuse me, you mean appropriation? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it became that, yes, or, or images were beginning to be appropriated, but also it seemed as though, I mean, the things that I myself was doing in my studio were involved with that. And so, you know, I looked around the world sort of, you know, with that uh, lens and sort of noticed that there were these various things that people did. Uh, there was even a dance company that predicated their choreography on uh, deaf mute sign language. But, you know, there was Grandmaster Flash doing the turntable mixes which intrigued me a great deal, sort of, you know, and I got to meet him through uh, mutual friends, et cetera, et cetera. And then also around that time, uh, David Byrne and Brian Eno uh, did the Bush of Ghosts, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts album. And that was, uh, you know, it was sort of using the soundtrack of radio evangelists and others, and they did America's Waiting. And it has this uh, evangelist preaching, et cetera, et cetera, and their soundtrack. And then on top of it, uh, Bruce Connor, the filmmaker, used found footage to make a video to accompany their song that used found language. And, uh, and so sort of, I thought this would be great. I should do like a show with all these different things. And Martha Wilson and Franklin Furness actually they, they are a book archive and they were sort of the hotbed of the creation of performance art. She said, yeah, try doing that. So I just, I wrote to David Byrne's record company and explained the project and explained why I thought he, you know, this thing would be valuable to have. And, you know, nothing happened. And, and then sort of the phone rang one day and I hear the voice of David Byrne saying, I'm calling for Larry List, you know, and I said, hi, he says, I got your letter. I'd like to lend you something. And so he did. And, uh, and also Grandmaster Flash signed off and we were able to have his turntable mixes, which was very exciting to me. And, uh, and that's how that happened. All yeah. very fortunate. But, you know, if, if you don't ask, though you should ask politely and you must always ask in a way where you explain why that person is of consequence and of and of importance to you you know you can't just write a fan letter like oh my god you're really good <laughs> you know like uh but you know if you can explain at least in new york it seems like everybody's interested in ideas and so if you write to people with an idea that they are a part of, it's surprising how often they will take the time to respond. And, um, and you just have to have some reason, some worthwhile reason for them to do so. Right, I hear you, that's a great story. And also what I'm hearing is that um, uh, somehow your generosity to other people and helping other people or interns by writing them letters of references and so on comes back to you when you ask artists to contribute their work. Um, they are often very generous with a good reason <laughs> that's you know, valorizing um, that they will often be generous as well. Yeah, well, like with Takako Saito, sort of when I first investigated artists who make chess sets, I saw her work and I wrote to her and we actually became pen pals. And mm -hmm. we, we exchanged sort of uh, letters and I send her little weird materials or this and that that she might like for her work and stuff. And I did that for 10 years or so. Until one day, she wrote me and she says, I'm going to be coming to Canada to do a performance. If I can come the whole way to Canada, can't you come to Canada so we can meet? And so 
I did, and it was this wonderful reconstruction of John Cage's reunion uh, performance, which uses an electronic chessboard. And friends of mine who were professional chess players got involved and, and stuff like that. And so I, I uh, went to Toronto, uh, I got to meet uh, Takako. I met this sort of wonderful curator, uh, Sarah Robio Sheridan, uh, who I've continued to be in touch with. And a lot of people and Takako and I sort of made contact. And so then she said, well, when you come to Europe, you come and visit. And so another couple of years later, uh, there was a reason for me to uh, travel over to Paris to do some Man Ray research. And I blocked in some time to go to Dusseldorf and lo and behold, sort of uh, went to her studio and uh, spent, wow, uh, a whole day and a half or so just going through her studio with her, visiting, learning about her, uh, getting to know her better. And we've been fast friends ever since. And um, efforts that I made to have shows of her work in America were greeted with enthusiasm and, and then uh, never followed through on. And that's the heartbreak of my life. But then she contacted me uh, as did Johanna Stahl when they were doing this big show first in Germany and then in Bordeaux and said, well, we'd really like you to contribute sort of like an essay to the catalog. And I did. And then uh, I had the opportunity to come over for the opening uh, at which we met, uh, et cetera. And then they extended the show six weeks and added a performance program. And I had mentioned to uh, Alice Motard, I said, well, you're in Bordeaux with the world's finest wine. Takako does wine chess performances and you have the world's best pastries and she does pastry chess. You know, you should consider having a performance night and lo and behold, uh, this additional funding came through, the show was extended and uh, Takako graciously invited me back over to uh, perform playing the, uh, the, the sound chess game with Dieter Daniels. And uh, uh, it was a pleasure to be able to sort of uh, play a small part in the performance and in her show and to get to see everybody again. So that's how things happen. It only took what, uh, 12 years, <laughs> a thousand letters, a few phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, what do you want to do with your life? I, I feel like that was all time well spent. It couldn't be better. And so I just hope that everyone else sort of, uh, you know, really pours their energies into the things they, the things and the people they love. That's a great story to end, um, to end this communication with. Uh, and yes, the Takako Saito, where we did meet and where I met uh, both Johanna Stahl, Takako herself, and uh, Kathy Grove, that was a, that was a great experience. Um, thanks again, Larry. And um, uh, thank you so much. I know my students and everyone else who, uh, who listened in has appreciated this very much. And we'll say bye-bye and also waiting for part two of the same thing in about a uh -huh. month. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.